Hello everyone, and welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about shear stresses and beams again. We're finishing up this chapter. Um, and there's several things we're going to look at. Well, one is how does shear flow through a thin-walled flange? And I've already gotten some complaints about the whole term shear flow. So we'll talk about that a little bit more and give it a little bit more of an idea of why it's called shear flow today. And also understand how to calculate the shear center of an asymmetric member. As a note, um, this is best shown through an example. So when we hit this, when we have the little topic, we talk about it. We're going to have to go through an entire example later on that shows you step by step how to do that. So if it doesn't make sense at first, don't worry. Watch the example videos and you'll be able to figure it out from there. Okay, so first off, why do we care? Well, let's look at this thing right here. You know, it's a twisting skyscraper. It's beautiful. I mean, it's an amazing feat of engineering. However, would you be feeling comfortable if you saw that its supports were similarly twisted? I wouldn't. And the whole shear center thing, that's that's very, very important. We're talking about different shaped beams. We have to make sure that we aren't causing them to twist just by how we're applying the load. So we'll get on that. Okay, but first off, let's talk about shear flow in a thin walled member. Now, the product of the shear stress at any point and that thickness is equal to the shear flow. We saw this before. So we can look at this thickness of our little wall. We have a shear stress and that's equal to shear flow. Okay, so step back here a minute. This is where we people are freaking out here. Um, what is shear flow? What's going on here? It is mostly saying how is the shear stress moving through this? I think they just like the term. Engineers are all about simplifying things, so rather than writing two letters, they wanted to write one. Okay? And we were able to connect this to various other things as we saw in the, ba on the past when we have like fasteners and things like that. But it's really just talking about where is the shear stress moving? How is the shear stress changing through this? And flow works really nicely because when you have shear stress from this side and this side, well, guess what? They add up when you go down, just like water flowing through channels. So if it confuses you why they use shear flow, you don't really have to use it. You can always kind of translate it back using this term. Now, what this tells us is that the shear flow at any point or shear stress is proportional to the first moment of area Q. So that's all nice and easy. But what you have to realize here is if we're starting from the edge, the first moment of area is not this full top here, or if I'm picking a point and it's like, let's say it's halfway in the middle right here, it's not the top area right there. It's only the area from where the shear flow is zero, which happens at the edges, to that point. So I'm gonna start here next to this edge and I go this way. This is the area that actually matters, okay? That is the area that actually matters. And so what you can see is that that shear flow will change as we move along our beam. But that's important, so please don't forget it. Now, if we want to get the total floors that's been developed in this upper flange, we can do that by integrating this equation. Okay? So we have an equation right here with this temporary variable s that just says, okay, our shear flow at any point is proportional to this. This is important. You're going to, in many problems, have to develop an equation, an equation for the shear flow, or an equation, more technically, for the first moment of area Q. Um, that's a function of some temporary variable. And then you integrate it. So the force in that flange is going to be integrated from the start right here all the way over to here. I integrate it all the way over and then I can figure out, okay, well, this is my shear flow. This is, I'm sorry, my, the force in this flange. Now, let's talk a little bit about why, okay, about why this is the case. Um, and to do that, I'm going to pull everything that's a constant right here. I'm going to pull it out of the integral real quick. So we'll have VTD over 2iz. That's all constant. Integral from 0 to b over 2 of s ds. Now if I just do an indefinite integral, what I get is, making sure I don't mess any, s squared over 2. Okay. 
as square root over 2, which is effectively, you know, if I'm going, my s is increasing, it's going to increase as a polynomial. Now, hopefully you remember that our shear flow in this section was increasing linearly. It increased linearly at that point. Okay, and our force is simply the area up until a particular point. So the area under this linearly increasing line will have that s squared. It will be a polynomial. And so that's where this is coming from. It's just the area of our shear flow, the area underneath the line of the shear flow. Okay, so don't forget, you're going to have to do these integrals. You're going to have to set up a um, value for Q, and we do have an example or two of that later on. Okay, now if we want to, we can then go to the web of the beam to figure out the shear flow there. So this one is a lot more difficult. It's not nearly as fun. Um, it's not terrible either, because you can see right here, this is the Q for the top. So this first term right here is the Q for the top, and the rest are going to be for this new section we're going to have to calculate, which is not fun to do at all. But we can figure it. So let's look at this right here. So what do we have at this point? Well, okay. This is our centroid, and this would be the full area, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet, okay? So where do we start? Well, we're starting right here and we're going down. So that height is going to be d over 2 minus y. y measured from the centroid. Okay, d over 2 minus y. That makes sense. That is going to be this distance right here. Just trying to find the height of this little section. And then what is the area? Well, the area is going to be that height right here, which we just calculated, which is d over 2 minus y. And we're going to multiply that by the thickness. And remember what q is, it's equal to the area times the distance from the actual centroid to its centroid. And so its centroid is going to be halfway between this point, which is y, and this point, which is d over 2. So that's right here. So we have our Q from our first section, and now Q from the second section. And if we want to, we can then calculate our force by integrating. It is not a fun integral, well, it's not a terrible integral, it's not fun going to get set up, but it's not too hard to do. So with that, we have our force and our web. This is only for a symmetric I beam, though, so please do not try to use this in every single equation. You can use the way it's set up, though. That's a good um, template for you for the future problems. Okay, so with that, what we get is we'll find the force in the web, and it's actually equal to our shear force, which is pretty nice. And we can also find the forces in the flow. Well, that's it for this time, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope this helps you. I'll see you all next time as we continue to talk about shear flow and how it moves through these thin-walled sections. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.